I'll give her one more minute and then we'll get going. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is TCPM. Uh, if you're not here for TCPM, then you're probably in the wrong place. Um, Yoshi and Michael Tuxen are on a video conference. Um, here's the note well. Uh, you're likely familiar with it, but it's the start of a new session. So if you're not, please take a close look. Um, as usual, the session is being recorded. Um, Andrew has kindly evolved to be no, uh, volunteered to be no, no caker. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, she's going to be JavaScript. Um, and as a reminder, use draft TCBM as the name for IDs when you publish them. Uh, next slide. Um, so for agenda, um, I'm going to start off with 15 minutes about the working group um, and status on documents. Um, RC 6937bis. Uh, it's going to be discussed by Neil. Uh, TCP accurate request. Uh, and do another update on that. Um, then 10 minutes for individual drafts uh, about service affinity. Um, and then there's also 20 minutes for ghost acts. Um, as you can see, here are the uh, working group documents currently in progress. Um, highlighted the ones that we're going to do updates on today. Uh, and I think that's that's it for the chair side. Yoshi, you want to say something about RFC 6937 this? Um, okay, yeah. We have a presentation for 6939 this draft today. Uh, basically, we have been running working group Rustico on this draft for a long time. So I think, you know, uh, today I think we can uh, discuss if we can conclude this working group Rustico or not. Um, so from uh, then, yeah, just watch the result of the discussion right now. Yeah, the accurate ECN draft is also after working group last call. Um, I had some final questions, suggestions regarding the text uh, describing um, offload, um, but I haven't heard from the authors yet. So. Um, the authors might want to consider answering. After that, we will have TCP generalized DC and stuff uh, going through the working group. TCP EDO and ECRAID are not there yet. And the first one is an RFC editor queue for, I don't know, 500 and days or more. So that's usually. OK, um, that means we can go to the first presentation. All right, let's see. You... Okay, great. Are you guys able to uh, hear me? Perfect, yes. Okay, great. All right, um, so today I'll be talking about uh, proportional rate reduction for TCP. Uh, this is work um, uh, that I've been joining recently, and that's uh, a long time effort started by Matt Mathis and Nandita and Yu Chang at Google. Uh, and I'm just helping out with. Um, with some recent uh, updates to the draft. Next slide, please. So uh, just a quick overview in history here. Um, proportional rate reduction for TCP was first published in 2013 as an experimental RFC. Uh, and at that time, it was only implemented for Linux TCP. Uh, and this was, of course, well before Rack. 
uh, and so it was implemented without uh, RAC TLP. Um, and PRR, you can sort of think of as a mini congestion control that runs only during fast recovery. And um, at a high level, the idea is to send packets at the ratio determined by the congestion controls uh, sea wind reduction. So for Reno, where you cut the sea wind in half, um, it'll be using that proportion. For Cubic, where you cut the sea wind to 0.7 times the previous sea wind, it'll be using that proportion. And if the amount of in-flight data drops below the SS thresh chosen by the congestion control, uh, then it will use one of two modes uh, to decide how aggressively to increase the amount of in-flight data. Um, it, the draft uses the terms um, slow start reduction bound and uh, uh, conservative reduction bound to describe those uh, two different modes. Um, and um, the in the original version of PRR back in 2013, the implementation had to pick between those two different mechanisms. Um, so an interesting fact actually is that a flow that um, mostly operates in fast recovery so, for example, a, uh, a video flow going through a cellular provider that polices traffic um, might spend a large portion of its lifetime in fast recovery. And in that case, the C wind of the connection is actually mostly controlled by uh, PRR rather than Cubic. Um, and look, to look at a packet trace, you basically need to think about um, the PRR behavior in order to understand what's going on. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So, um, 6937 BIS, um, the idea here was that uh, in 2021, um, we as a community realized that um, we, it's been 10 years since 6937 was published. And at this point, PRR is pretty widely implemented in the major TCP stacks. Uh, it's default enabled in Linux, FreeBSD uh, deployed by Netflix, uh, and in Windows TCP. Um, and so the TCPM group voted to revise and publish this as a standard RFC. Uh, there's a link there to the, the current version of the draft. And uh, the main revisions uh, since 6937 that we've previously discussed uh, include some algorithm refinements. So the main in, uh, refinement and the most interesting one is that the algorithm now includes an automatic uh, heuristic that automatically chooses between the two different uh, techniques for uh, handling the case where the amount of in-flight data is below SS thresh, so that it automatically um, determines how aggressive to be based on the signals it's getting about how, whether the connection is making good progress uh, without causing additional losses. Uh, the second main change is that it specifies that Upon entering fast recovery, we want to make sure that we force a fast retransmit. Uh, there are some edge cases where that wouldn't happen. Um, that's, um, uh, yeah, so that's the second one. The third one is that we specify uh, non-SAC support, what should happen in the case of connections that don't have SAC support. Uh, and then finally, um, it specifies an approach that's that has improved handling in case a connection has experienced higher network reordering than the default. Um, and in that case, um, there can be a, a fair amount of data that's been selectively acknowledged before fast recovery starts. If, for example, you're using RAC TLP to adapt to reordering. Um, and um, all of those uh, have, all of those algorithm refinements have been in, in Linux TCP for a number of years. I'm not sure which other stacks um, have uh, those variants, but but these are all very well tested and, and widely deployed at this point. Um, we also made some uh, editorial clarifications um, that are described here. Um, you know, we don't want to slow start an X that trigger the the six six seven five last resort mechanism. Uh, it clarified the relationships with. Um, uh, RFC 6675 and uh, 8985 RAC TLP. 
And then we remove the experiments section since that's a bit obsolete at this point. Uh, since, for example, the baseline algorithms don't exist in the Linux TCP code anymore. So it was hard to rerun those. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So this is just a quick summary of the, the changes between the version four of the draft, um, which was the, the version at the time we last presented this in July of 2023, and the current version of the draft, uh, which is version eight. Um, and the good news is that there have been only really very minor changes between four and eight. Um, and so I, um, I'm hoping that we can today perhaps come to a consensus about concluding the, the last calls now or soon. Um, and then specific changes, um, if we want to go version by version. In version five, um, we basically just updated the recover flight size initialization um, to more closely match the Linux uh, implementation. Um, and um, then uh, in, on the list, um, Richard uh, Schaffenegger um, gave us some good feedback that, you know, the, it's, we, it probably makes more sense to stick with initializing the recover FS, uh, flight size to pipe, which um, at a high level is, makes a lot more sense in terms of algorithm behavior. Uh, and, you know, and we agreed with that uh, recommendation. So we, we did that in version six. Uh, in version seven, we just restored some prose text about that initialization or initializing recover flight size to pipe. Uh, and then we added a reference to uh, Janie Ho's SIGCOM 96 paper um, that included rate halving, uh, which is you know, a core idea that um, PRR uh, incorporates and, and expands upon. Um, and then in version eight, um, there's some minor, minor editorial changes um, and that's pretty much it. And that's the last slide. So hopefully, um, yeah, we can just pick up on a discussion of, of where we want to go from here. And I'll take whatever advice the, the chairs want to offer here. Thanks, Neil. Um, it doesn't appear we have any, any questions. Um, oh, here she. Yeah, I'm just curious about the implementation status. I think uh, Linux already support uh, 6939 BIS draft. And then according to Richard, I think FreeBSD also supports 6937 BIS draft. But uh, I just would like to know if there is other implementation that support this one. Nobody knows. I think you're correct for FreeBSD, but I can't. I don't know about any other implementation. Mm. And the Linux support this one, right, Neil? Sorry, could you uh, could you say again? Uh, Linux already support everything. Describe yeah. sixty nine such seventy stuff. Yes, that's right. Okay. Linux also uses RecoverFS being initialized with pipe. Uh, no, it so Linux um, for that initialization, it it initializes recover flight size um, to the um, the actual initialization is to the congestion window because the this sort of gets back to the the uh, related question, a long time question in this um, working group about when um, you enter fast recovery, should you um, pick the uh, slow start threshold based on um, a multiplicative decrease relative to the congestion window or a multiplicative decrease relative to flight size? And you know the standards all say this should be versus flight size. Um, but uh, the experience in the Linux community, including with Google and YouTube, is that um, setting the C wind in recovery as a function of flight size is is way too conservative and leads to 
unusably poor performance. And so Linux for many years, um, at least say 15 years, maybe, maybe forever, um, has used um, CWIND as the basis for the multiplicative decrease. And so this is kind of a, an area of the PRR implementation where there's some, uh, where the implementation is sort of affected by that decision. Um, but we sort of can consider that an implementation detail that is related to that um, design choice that is sort of a little bit outside of the scope of PRR. And we don't necessarily want to open that can of worms in the PRR discussion. Um, so we thought it made sense just to, to document the initialization of recovery of flight size at pipe um, because it, it's, it's a theoretically cleaner approach and it's a minor difference in behavior um, relative to the actual Linux implementation. Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Martin Duke Google with a rapidly disappearing hat. Um, so are there any open issues or, or, or what's, what are the next steps with this draft? Are we just uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, in the draft itself, there aren't any open issues. Um, but, uh, you know, whatever the chairs recommend at this stage makes sense to me. This way, the chair's point of view, there is no outstanding comment. And the document right. is very stable for now. Well, cool. Let's sh ship it then to me or I had, depending on what day you press the button. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I'll, I would actually tend to agree that it seems like this is, is quite a ways along. And um, maybe the other question is, with, what is the reason that we would not uh, move this along at this point? Like, does, does anyone have other objection? Like, or they want more implementation experience? Like, is there a thing that people would want <clears throat> before we move this along? Or is, or is this just, um, we're saying yes. And... heard very quiet responses, so I'm going to assume that that's probably an indication we should move it on. I think so. Um, well, thank you, Neil. Unless you want to add anything else, um, I think we're all set. No, I, think, I think we're all set. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez and I'm going to present the last update of the draft entitled TCP Upgrade Request TAR Option. My co-author is John Krogroff from the University of Cambridge. Next, please. Uh, Michael's actually... Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so first of all, uh, Quick reminder on the motivation for the draft. Delayed DAX is a widely used mechanism which is intended to reduce protocol overhead. However, it may also contribute to suboptimal performance in a number of scenarios, such as so-called large congestion window scenarios, meaning a congestion window size much greater than the MSS, where saving more than one of every two acts may help improve performance, and also so-called small congestion window scenarios, meaning a congestion window size up to the order of one MSS, where delayed acts may incur delay, may limit congestion, window growth, and so on. Next, please. So this is the main TAR option format. It carries the R field, which indicates the act rate requested by the sender, meaning uh, the number of data segments after which a receiver uh, should uh, transmit an ACK. And then there's also the special case of R equal to zero, which allows to uh, perform a request of an immediate ACK uh, from the receiver while keeping the steady state value of R. Next, please. On the status of the draft, it was adopted around one year ago. Today I'm presenting version 04, which mostly aims to address the comments that were received during the last ITF. Next, please. So let's go through the updates in 04. First of all, there was a major comment by Bob Briscoe that it would be good to clarify what 
uh, overrides tar and what is overridden by tar. So there was some discussion and uh, contributions there uh, from Jonathan and Gori. And the conclusion was that it would be good to add a general statement if possible, and then also to perform a survey looking for the specifications that may uh, provide rules on when to generate acts. So regarding a general statement, we have added at the end of the introduction in the last paragraph that TAR allows to override the delayed acts mechanism from RFC 1122 while complying with the maximum act delay of 500 milliseconds. And we've also added that, however, standard struct TCP specifications other than RFC 1122 and some informational specifications that recommend or mandate triggering acts in special conditions prevail over TAR. Then we point the reader to section 3.2 and appendix B for further details. Section 3.2 uh, describes the receiver behavior in TAR and appendix B, uh, next please. Appendix B contains the result of the survey that we have carried out. We have looked at around uh, 100 documents uh, looking for content uh, specifying rules on when to send acts in special conditions. So uh, the result of those documents which contain such uh, kind of rules is in Appendix B. And of course, if anyone detects anything that we have missed, please let us know. So, First of all, regarding standard track documents, the first one is RFC 1122, which specifies that the receiver may send an act in response to an out-of-order segment that was intended to support the Biden experimental fast retransmit algorithm. This was then uh, increased in RFC 2018. It, the may was increased to should, and also it was indicated that the act had to include a selective act option for every valid segment that contains new data. And all this was uh, reinforced in RFC 5681 uh, by stating that a receiver should send a duplicate ad immediately when an out-of-order segment arrives. And also a receiver should send an immediate act when the incoming segment fills in all or part of a gap in the sequence space. So as you can see colored in green, um, this content was already covered, already part of section 3.2 of the TAR specification. So we didn't have to perform any action regarding actually the three RFCs indicated here. Next, please. However, there are two other standard track documents that were not covered yet in the previous version of the draft. The first one is RFC 5961, which tries to provide protection against an off-path attacker that may want to reset an existing uh, TCP connection. And uh, the text in 5961 is that if uh, a receiver gets a segment with a reset bit set and the sequence number doesn't exactly match the next expected sequence value, yet it is within the current receive window, then the TCP receiver must send an act, which is called a challenge act, which will help determine whether the other endpoint is actually an attacker or not. So uh, this text was not covered yet in 03. So what we've done is we have added explicitly this text in uh, section 3.2 in the latest version, 04. And also there's the draft, the accurate TCN draft, which also provides some rules to generate acts in some special conditions. There are change triggered acts where an accurate TCN data receiver should emit an act whenever a data packet mark CE arrives after the previous packet was not CE. And also increment triggered acts where an accurate ECN receiver of a packet must emit an act if a number N of C marks have arrived since the previous act. So this was not either in the previous version of TAR. So now we have also included this explicitly as part of the behavior of the receiver in section 3.2. Next, please. Also in, in the appendix, we have included informational documents. We have found two which are relevant here. The first one is RFC 5690 AXCC, which, as you may remember, was already discussed in the TAR document in Appendix A. This appendix aims to clarify the similarities and differences between AXCC and TAR. And AXCC aims to uh, pr perform congestion control for AX, whereas TAR is a bit more generic and perhaps can be used as a tool for that. Also, TAR has uh, the special feature of requesting an immediate act. 
Anyway, we understand that uh, there is no further action that we have to do on the TAR document regarding this RFC 5619. And then the other informational document that we understand is relevant here is RFC 8257, which uh, describes uh, data center TCP. Um, it has some rules to uh, generate acts in special conditions, which were not covered in the previous version of the TAR document. So the rules are indicated here. Um, when a receiver gets a packet with the C code point set and the variable called dctcp.c is false, then the receiver must send an immediate ACK. Also, if the C code point is not set, but the variable is true, then the receiver must also send an immediate ACK. And also a receiver may choose to send two ACKs, one for previously unacknowledged packets and another one acknowledging the most recently received packet. So we've also added uh, this content, these rules explicitly in uh, section 3 to 2 in the last version of the document. Next, please. And regarding experimental documents, we found that RFC uh, 4782, uh, which specifies quick start, is relevant here. Um, the document explains that a sender using quick start may produce a sudden increase of pure acts. And the document also explains that in the absence of a mechanism for ACK congestion control, the TCP receiver could limit its sending rate for ACKs uh, sent in response to quick start data packets. And then a formula is given in the RFC to determine after how many received data segments the receiver needs to transmit an ACK. Uh, we understand that TAR can be used to allow a quick start sender to request the ACK rate to be used by the receiver. And we understand that we don't need to perform any particular action in the TAR document related with the quick start RFC. Uh, next, please. So summarizing, section 3.2 has been updated, uh, that's the receiver behavior, has been updated to clearly and explicitly include the rules regarding act generation from these three documents, uh, RFC 5961, which tries to protect TCP, in this case from uh, off-path attackers, uh, 8257, which is the uh, data center TCP, and the accurate ECN draft. Also, there was a comment by Gori um, that prompted the, the last point, which is that uh, after explaining the general behavior that uh, the TAR receiver should send uh, an ACK after R data segments received, then we've added that the receiver's count of data segments received from the sender is reset every time that the NAC is sent for any reason. Next, please. Finally, uh, there was another comment by Gori uh, regarding what happens if the receiver, receiver window size changes. That's uh, because the sender, there's a rule that it must not uh, request a value of R greater than the current uh, receiver window size, but then what happens if the receiver window size changes? So we've added some text uh, intended to address or explain what happens in the perhaps short time during which uh, there is a bit of desynchronization there that the sender hasn't yet realized of the receiver window size change. So uh, in the section 3.1, which describes the sender behavior, we've added that if the receiver window size has increased and the sender doesn't know yet, anyway, the sender will not request an R value corresponding to an amount of data bytes to be acknowledged at once greater than the current receiver window size. So there is no issue here. And otherwise, if the receiver window size has decreased and the sender uh, doesn't know yet, a request of an R value uh, leading to an amount of data bytes to be acknowledged at once greater than the current receiver window size will be anyway ignored by the receiver. And that's based on previously existing rules in 3.2 in the previous version of the draft. And finally, we've also added in section 3.2 about on the receiver side, that if the receiver window size decreases to a value which is lower than the amount of data bytes to be acknowledged at once for the latest R requested, then the amount of data bytes acknowledged at once by an ACK to be sent by the receiving TCP must not exceed its current receiver window size. Next, please. So, well, that was everything from my side. I don't know if there are maybe questions or comments.
Hi. Uh, hi, Ruth Enghart. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the implementation status of this? Yeah, at this moment, I'm only aware of some prototype implementation that actually was led by uh, Michael Tuxen uh, for FreeBSD. So yeah. any further implementation activity uh, that anyone is aware of, uh, please let us know. Are you engaging with implementers at all on this hackathon project kind of thing? Not usually, but yeah, perhaps I may have to engage as well in, in this kind of activity. Uh, yeah. Martin Duke, Google. Uh, the um, to what extent do we think data from the quick experience with this is applicable in terms of like performance and tuning and all the other stuff? I know that's not your draft, but the author of that is nearby. <laughs> so if either of you feel you can answer that, that would be great. So. Uh... Well, I haven't performed like a detailed study about that, but my kind of immediate reaction would be to say that it should be quite applicable. Um, I don't see like fundamental differences actually, mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps there are details out there that maybe we might need to double check. Oh, Ian Sweat is an individual contributor as well as author of the uh, or one of the authors of the act frequency drafting quick. I think for the most part, um, it's applicable, but there's a, uh, some critical differences uh, about TCP and how implementations work, in particular things like um, how acknowledgements work with GRO um, and other kind of receive, offload, and aggregation. Mm -hmm. um, these can greatly reduce the number of acknowledgements sent in real world applications, you know, obviously implementation dependent, um, but at least I believe in Linux. Um, and so, the marginal gain of this might be smaller, I guess would be one thing to, to point out. Um, but I think probably the end tuning you would want would end up being extraordinarily similar. Um, so that'd be my comment. So so it is going to be different um, in some ways, but I'm not sure if the end result of like what kind of parameter optimization values you'd want to use ends up, would end up being meaningful different, meaningfully different or not. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is um, given that this is not um, we're going to have to have a, make a decision about this document probably before we have like wide deployment experience. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so like I, one part is like, is it doesn't have to be as beneficial as quick uh, for the reasons you described, but the direction should be right. And, and I guess the other concern is a safety one, because obviously metal boxes do all kinds of weird things to TCP. Are we, um, are we making something really unhappy in the network with this, which can't happen in quick? And I don't know if you have any insight on that. I'm not aware currently of any particular uh, danger. Anyway, yeah, we've been trying to to be careful about uh, not to break, let's say, the the basics synchronization between sender and receiver, not to mm -hmm. kind of damage uh, communication performance. Um, well, I mean, like, for example, uh, um, it's been a while since I've dealt with, but I, I'm aware that at some point there have been like act thinners deployed in the network. And, um, you know, if like they're thinning, th if we thin the acts and then they get thinned again, that, that could be not so good. Um, anyway, uh, like, I don't expect you have an answer to that right now. I think there's some things to maybe consider and look at. I think that's the safety concern that would maybe be the major obstacle to something like this moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Uh, yeah, we're going to think about it and consider that for the next date. Thank you. Um, Gori, you're next. Yeah, I, can you hear me? Yes. Wow, long delay. So um, I was going to chime in on the same as Martin, really, because I think the difference between TCP and Quick here is that there are devices in the network. Some of them might be old, that might be more worrying. Um, some of them might not be old, but they try to control the act rate in the network for TCP. And the good news is for Quick, they can't do that, so they don't. 
So I'm kind of looking for the data which shows how they interact with these proposals. I don't know how we get that data, but I would love to see that data to be confident that what we're doing here in implementing this actually works in the deployed networks and doesn't make it worse. Do you have a plan for how you might get that data? Well, uh, there is not a plan, but uh, yeah, definitely such data would be great. The, the document intended status is experimental. So uh, also, yeah, let's say that uh, it would be good to experiment with this and obtain experience based on that. Um, yeah, let's see what we can come up with. But also, I'd like to maybe uh, make a call to anyone who might like to engage in this kind of effort to try to to deploy, uh, implement this document and, and perform experiments. Uh, maybe you can get in contact with, with us, the authors. And yeah, let's maybe try to, to get uh, this kind of data if possible. Thanks, Rui. Uh, Matt? Yes, I was just starting an investigation where I'm looking at ACK inner arrival times. And I've, I've been musing for a long time about the potential for multiplicative ACK thinning, or there are multiple stages in the path, pretty much the same problem that other people are mentioning. Multiple parts of the path where people thin the ACKs. Um, there is a single sentence in DOCSIS which recommends ACK thinning. It doesn't specify it at all, but it's in the standard. And um, so I'm very worried about this. Um, luckily, I do have a data set. Um, Me Measurement Lab has got a run rate now of about 4 million tests a day. And almost all of those tests have PCAPs. And I'm actually harvesting those PCAPs for information on, on ACK processing arc ac inner arrival and i would love to talk about some of this stuff out of band so thank you matt that sounds extraordinarily promising i appreciate your uh, your help yeah. and it's a global four million tests a day okay all right thank you Yep. Uh, I think that I think that's it. Did you have anything you want, else you want from the working group? No, no, no. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate the update. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Mm. Uh, my name is Li Shi Ting I'm from China Telecom, and uh, my topic today is service affinity solution for TCP-based application. And uh, below is our um, draft, and uh, if you are interested, please feel free to review it. Next, please. And uh, uh, my presentation will run below aspect including background and motivation of this draft and uh, considerations of the existing solutions and the proposed solutions and further actions. Next, please. And uh, um, as the number of customers and service requirements continue to rise, there is a pressing need for network to be more flexible and uh, responsive. And it's called a uh, preferring uh, allowing service to be deployed across various resource pools. However, this also introduced challenge to efficiently directing customer traffic to the optimal service node, especially when multi nodes share the same endcast IP address. Uh, the dynamic um, the dynamic nature of network status and computing uh, resource pose a challenge. Traditional methods of traffic during rely on status connection tables, uh, which are unable to adapt to real-time chains. 
This can result in suboptimal uh, routine decisions leading to great customer experience. Uh, additionally, uh, load balancers deployed in front of physical serves can become bottlenecks during big, uh, peak traffic per next place. Uh, maintaining large, large attention tables in network device for uh, its customer flow looks uh, flexible and extensible, particularly for large-scale uh, service deployments. Moreover, traditional redirection methods like DNA red, uh, redirection suffer from catching issues, causing delays in directing traffic to a label, uh, available source. This inefficiency uh, ultimately impact customer satisfaction and uh, service reliability. So uh, to address this challenge, we post a solution for the uh, service affinity between uh, client and the server based on one newly defined DCP option, which can realize uh, comprehensive scheduling based on real-time network status. This solution eliminates the uh, need to maintain customer-based connection data tables for network device and uh, improve the flexible and scalable of uh, a large-scale deployment of any cost service scheduling. Next, please. Uh, so in our uh, considerations for optimized network traffic management, uh, we've identified several limitations in existing solutions. Um, for example, in load balancer and uh, well effective for distributing traffic, load balancer can become bottlenecks during peak usage per uh, impacting overall network performance. Um, and uh, direct traffic uh, and direct traffic re uh, redirections and traffic scheduling between the client and server can avoid the bottleneck of load balancer. And in MPTCP, it enables hosts to send packet to belong to one connection over a uh, different path, but it is confined to the MPTCP framework. So we want to find one solution that can meet such requirements in more general manner for TCP-based application. And uh, uh, HTTP uh, redirection, this method primarily involves communication between clients and servers and uh, does not provide real-time optimization based on network and computing resource data. And uh, in DNA, uh, DNS redirection turns to DNS records take time to uh, propagate, uh, prop propagate affecting customer experience due to potential delays in accessing updates server location. Uh, so uh, we propose a solution to address these limitations. And next, please. Next, please. And uh, uh, the procedures for the service affinity solution and the transmission process of package are shown in, uh, in the pictures. The proposed uh, service of entity solution involves the following steps. Uh, in the solution, a new flag SAF is required for identify the sender support DCP service uh, affinity option. And the first customer A sent um, a request to packet to the ingress router RE with SYN and the SAF flag site, indicating spots uh, for the uh, TCP service affinity option. The destination address is set to the unicast IP address of the service. And then um, ingress router RE evaluates real-time network and the computing resource data to determine the optimal 
a ser service node for customer is raised, such as the node behind the uh, router R4. And then if the select service node supports the DCP uh, service affinity, affinity option, it includes its IP address and port information in the TCP phone um, a file packet of the connection response message. And uh, customer A established a connection to the specific, a specific service node address providing the response, maintaining it until communication end. Uh, throughout the entire process, network device only need to broadcast the information about the computer network including the any cost IP uh, address, status of service node, and the specific address of service node. With this information optimized, the scheduling of uh, community networks resource can be performed, ensure efficient service delivery based on uh, real-time network and uh, computing resource status. And next please. And uh, in our draft, uh, option it's by ANA, but none of them can match the demand of uh, service of NT. So uh, we defined two new TCP options, APUA service of NT, and uh, app value service affinity option. And in the pictures, you can see the encoding of them and some de uh, definitions. Mm, these options are carried in the TCP phone packet sent by the service node. And the address card must be the address owned by the service node. After rece uh, receiving the TCP phone package, if this TCP option is included in the package, uh, the customer will establish the connection to the address specified in this, uh, in this option. And next, please. Um, in service of entry scenarios, the risk of traffic hijacking and DDoS attacks pose significant concerns uh, attackers may exploit the service affinity flag SAF by sending TCP pass, um, packet to service node, uh, potentially uh, gaining access to their any cost IP address and launching illegal activities or DDoS attacks. So uh, to mitigate this risk uh, in DDoS attack provision, we will implement a firewall uh, as a protective barrier ensure that uh, traffic accessing service node undergoes thorough filtration before uh, reaching its destination. And uh, this proactive measure helps to avoid potential uh, DDoS attacks by filtering out malicious traffic. And uh, uh, for the serve uh, information security, users and sites accessing the network can undergo authentication and verification uh, process to prevent um, authorized access and information threat on the serve. This ensures that only legitimate entities are granted access to sensitive server information. And furthermore, uh, CAS solution offer comprehensive defense against various network attacks. By leveraging these security models in conjunction with uh, firewalls, CAS solution bolster uh, network defense against common and emerging threats safeguarding the integrity and availability of uh, service. Um, and next, please. 
uh, and uh, that's the main content of this presentation. And uh, any uh, comments, please feel free to contact us via email. And thank you. Uh, Ian Spett from Google as an individual um, contributor, not chair. Um, first question is, uh, why would we not, why is this the right layer to be doing this? In particular, like if you're already going to have an authentication mechanism, why not do this inside like the TLS encryption envelope where um, a number of the attacks you mentioned, I think would be at the very least massively more difficult. Uh, okay, that's a good question. And uh, I need to consider this. So can my colleagues from me and John that answer it first? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, a couple of comments. So why are you using a flag in the sim and why don't you just reuse your option? That would save a flag, I guess. Um, regarding the options, why are you using reserved fields? Why don't you put the port number there and you have alignment and don't need reserved fields? And the last question is, <clears throat> have you tested this with some sort of middle boxes? I mean, a soon fin exchange is not looking very common. Uh, okay, and uh, th this question, can my colleague from V answer it first? Okay, go for it. Is, is, yeah. Hello, Alex, my turn. I'm not stomping on it. Uh, oh, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, Adrian from Telecom. I try to answer one question. Uh, uh, we use a flag just to uh, use the result field to define a new flag, uh, just to single that the uh, customer support the uh, new set options. So the once the server receives this, uh, uh, the, the TCP sync uh, single with this flag set, then uh, the server can send the uh, uh, newly address to the customers. So we, we just want to uh, uh, keep the TCP connection very quickly to finish the, its uh, connection. So why can't you, instead of setting the flag, put in your option in the soon without an address, just oh, no. the option? Uh, uh, the option is uh, carried is uh, sent back from server to the customer from server to yeah, the client. Send it, send it from the client without an address, just as an indicator. I want to do this. Uh, you you say the flag. Yeah. Okay. You say you say your suggestion is you uh, the customer send the option uh, directly to the server and we and do not use the flag. Do not, do not uh, define a newly flag. Just use the flag you have. Uh, just use the option you have, but without any value. Uh, okay, I think this is the one. We, we can consider this suggestion later. Mm. <clears throat> what about the middle boxes? Uh, we have uh, we have uh, do some um, demo uh, in the public network, and uh, uh, if the if the server uses the public address, there is no question to pass the uh, middle box. Uh, yeah. We have just uh, we have done some implementation for this uh, this uh, draft, uh, but not test all kind of the uh, middle box. Uh, but there is no uh, there is no problem encountered in our testing scenarios. We did not test the 
all of the the all all kind of the middle box. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, as explained in the job, I think uh, uh, you know because uh, the network want to uh, uh, optimize the traffic based on the network status. So. Uh, we, we obviously we will deploy the any cast service and the net the entry the entry point of network one can do the optimized selection for the traffic. So uh, we we compare our solutions such as TCP and base and the DNS. There is no uh, no suitable solution to uh, to solve such problems. And uh, if there is if the TCP does not support the um, Service affinity applications. There, the the device with the network must uh, must store many 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 table. Uh, that is the uh, um, uh, same the same number as the client. So it, we think it, such solution is not uh, uh, not not uh, deployable. Cannot deployable. So we prefer uh, use this kind of solution. and uh, another another. And uh, certainly, the, the quick has similar mechanism to for the server uh, migration. So I think, but the TCP has no such mechanism. So we think uh, we need such mechanism to uh, to um, meet our requirement. <clears throat> okay, thank you, uh, Alexander. Hello, Alex. Um, talking. Um, I'm kind of still feeling uh, sort of a bit new to this. I've been flicking through the mailing list. Um, it does feel a bit like this has been done at the wrong layer. Um, I'm One of the scenarios, another possible solution is to do tunneling between your service nodes. Um, that would avoid problems with uh, everything that you described in your slide there. A lot of any cast deployments will tunnel between service nodes if they need to, if, if the traffic's landed in the wrong location because of wider network topology changes um has ha, was, was that something just considered and not on the deck or in the present in, in in the draft or is that a non-option for you uh you 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 suggested that we use the uh, um, tunnel tunnel service to accomplish the requirement uh, no, as a solution for mm. if traffic is landing at the or has been determined to now land at the wrong any car service to tunnel to, it, it's like between the service nodes, your service mesh, why not just steer and reroute the traffic to the other service node? I understand there might, you might be looking for a shorter latency, but then if you're redirecting the person anyway at the TCP layer, you've kind of lost the, the the advantages of any cast in the first place. Um, so I'm trying to understand why you would just not do tunneling behind the scenes, behind the curtain, um, and get the traffic to its right place. Until you had an opportunity maybe to uh, redirect the client to a nearer node through another method, if that helped you. I'm trying to understand why you would do this in the TCP layer rather than behind the scenes or as some other people have suggested at a different layer. Like if this is HTTP, I mean, we talked about redirects, but um, for whatever reason, they don't work here. Uh, because, you know, uh, kind of, uh, there are many applications that are not based on the HTTP. They just use the TCP. So we just want to make the solution more general. Uh, and the and the second consideration is the the, the first selection uh, is made by the uh, network uh, uh, network device uh, based on its topology and status and the network uh, net transfer conditions and uh, um, but uh, uh, when the network change the uh, the service will be directed to other uh, other service node so. We don't want. We want to keep the service affinity. So we uh, we want to the 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 client use the uh, real real address to connect to the server. 
so there there is one phase for the uh, address address transfer. So first, uh, the client connect to the anycast address of the server, then transfer to the real address of uh, its uh, of the servers. So uh, after the transfer after the uh, transfer, uh, the service will the connection will will not be changed. Uh, um, based on the network topology change. So we, 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 we call this the service affinity. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. I, I would like to... I, I think... Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, maybe I explain not very clear. So uh, if you have other question or comment, we can discuss on the mail list. I can explain to you more clearly. Of course, I'll do that. I, I, I've popped an email onto the list, and we can hash it out there. That'd be fine. Uh, yeah, I would, I'll, I'll go through the remaining two people. Uh, thanks, Yoshi and Lars. And then I'd like to get on to the next presentation, because I, I am wondering if it might have a fair amount of discussion afterwards as well. So, um, oh, Yoshi, did you? I guess Lars? I think, yeah. Yoshi, go first. Uh, so I have some you know, security concern with this draft. So uh, you mentioned that you know uh, we can use you know some mechanism that you know prevent those attack or traffic hijacking. But uh, is this optional or is this mandatory? Because you know my concern is you know if we use this proposal as it is without any mechanism, I think it's really scary. Because you know, all I need to inject is just you no know, pin, take the pin packet, just one packet. If I succeed to injecting this fake pin packet, then I can redirect all your connection to my local server, and then after that, I can do whatever I want. So I just would like to have a security concern, and then you need to think of. So you, I think I need to uh, enhance you know, what kind of security mechanism you need for this approach. That's my opinion. Yeah, uh, we have discussed the, the, the security um, research member with a, prop, with a possible solution for our proposal. And uh, they told us there, is, there was no, <laughs> no suitable uh, uh, security, security enhanced uh, solution. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, is there any person in the TCPM can give us a guide for the uh, security enhancement uh, solutions? Uh, we are eager to um, get the proposal from or uh, suggestion from others. All right. Thank you. Hi, uh, Lars Eckert. So I, I think we've seen presentations of this draft several times at various ITFs and. Uh, my memory is far from perfect, but I think the issues that are raised are more or less the same time and time again. And I, I'm kind of wondering um, if we sort of reach the end of the road for this draft, because I, I don't really see a progression here. I, the, the group gives feedback that maybe the, the approach here is sort of uh, something that is already questionable and then security issues and other things. But the proponents come back and say, no, we really want this. And then it's sort of, it seems like we're going in circles here for a while now, and we got to sort of figure out a way to break that circle. Thanks, Lars. I appreciate that. Um, I locked the queue, but does anyone, do other the chairs have anything else to add before we move on? There. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon. Can you folks see me? Very good. Yes. So hello and, and good afternoon uh, from Germany. My name is Christian Russell, and I'm a security researcher at the CISPA Helmholtz Center for Information Security, Germany. I'm presenting joint work with my PhD student, Yipeng Pan. And the talk is about a phenomenon we dubbed ghost acts. And it is part of our research paper on TCP spoofing that we will be presenting at the IEEE Security Privacy Symposium in May this year. 
And one primer up front, I'm new to the format of IETF meetings, so I might not use the same terminology as the regular attendees are used to. So please excuse that. Next slide, please. When thinking about um, spoofing in, in TCP, you, know, you normally think about uh, TCP injection attacks, which is the most typical attack that comes to mind. Uh, and in this example, an off-path attacker tries to inject payloads into an established uh, TCP connection. So for example, if you look at the example uh, figure at the bottom of this presentation, uh, you see that there is a client, an FTP client that has a connection to an FTP server and an attacker in, tries to inject um, malicious FTP commands into this unprotected TCP connection, for example, by deleting, uh, in order to delete a file on the, on the file server. To this end, the attacker has to know that the connection exists, uh, including the client's IP address and uh, source port information and so on. And furthermore, the client has to guess certain TCP um, characteristics, such as the acknowledgement number and the sequence number to specify in the spoofed requests. In the presentation, I will focus on the uh, SAC ACK, so the acknowledgement number that the attacker has to choose in order to uh, spoof. Uh, as in some scenarios, the uh, sequence number um, is actually known to the attacker right away. Unfortunately, if you look at the um, typical, uh, the, the main basis TCP standard RC 9293, uh, it is quite tolerant uh, on this handling of um, acknowledgement numbers, uh, suggesting to accept any acknowledgement number which is more or equal to the next um, next pointer. And this doesn't provide much protection against brute forcing attacks, um, and hence attackers can easily find acceptable acknowledgement numbers in the standard uh, TCP. Next slide, please. Hence, um, RC 5961 shrinks the range of acceptable egg numbers um, by considering spoofing attacks, which significantly lowers the chance that attackers find an acceptable egg number uh, by brute forcing. That is, instead of just checking that uh, the acknowledgement number is smaller than uh, next, the RC says that the acknowledgement number should also be at most one cent window back uh, in order to be acceptable, and otherwise should be rejected. So if you look at the representation of the Sanders TCP state uh, at the bottom, you're going to see a couple of green boxes that show bytes that uh, were already sent and were acknowledged um, by, by the other, by the recipient. Then there is a couple of yellow or ochre boxes um, which show bytes that are uh, sent but were not acknowledged yet, uh, being pointed to the uh, being pointed by to the by the uh, UNA pointer. And then there is gray boxes that will be bytes to be sent next, being pointed to the sent next pointer. So in the figure, you can see which acknowledgements will be accepted, uh, which is up to uh, send next, which makes sense, and, and down to uh, send UNA minus send window, which means that we do have for this example, uh, I think about just seven uh, bytes to be acceptable in, in if they're specified as the acknowledgement number in the X segments. This explicitly includes some of the green bytes, um, meaning those that were already, already being acknowledged, and hence tolerates uh, duplicate acknowledgements. And this is exactly the region which can become problematic uh, if you consider a fresh TCP connection. Next slide, please. So if you look at a fresh uh, TCP connection, you have no dates, uh, no data to be exchanged yet. Uh, so the UNA pointer is uh, equal to the next pointer, and there simply has not been data, any data being sent yet. Unfortunately, in this example, um, the duplicate X are even allowed in this case, even though there's actually nothing to acknowledge yet. So if the attacker chooses um, to spoof acknowledgement numbers from that uh, red range here, which is the same as the green range, um, the, 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 um, the window range before in the previous slide, but this time trying to acknowledge data that wasn't sent yet. And um, that she, uh, if you look at the two RFCs that restrict the range of acceptable act numbers, you can see that both RFC 5961 and 9293 do allow for such uh, acknowledgement of da uh, data that was actually not sent, which we are going to dub ghost hacks in, in the presentation. And unfortunately, this has consequences um, from a security perspective, because these loose um, act number checks enables attackers to inject data into especially a newly established TCP connection, 
which eases um, both TCP injection attacks, but also um, IP spoofing attacks in, in TCP. Next slide, please. In order to guarantee that one of their uh, spoof segments uh, hits an acceptable acknowledgement number, attackers just have to brute force the egg number space uh, by incrementing the acknowledgement number they specify by send window. So uh, that means that large send windows thus reduce the complexity of brute forcing of fresh connections. Attackers just have to try uh, 2 to the power of 32, so 4 billion times, divided by uh, send window times to hit an acceptable egg value. So if you consider a very large window of one terabyte, for example, this ultimately means attackers just have to try uh, four different segments and one of them will hit the correct uh, into the correct send window. And in, in this example, the attacker uh, just divides the X space in the three parts. And the second injected acknowledgement number would hit an acceptable acknowledgement number. And unfortunately, those ghost acts not only ease injection attacks. Uh, in, in fact, in our research paper, we mostly focus on TCP spoofing attacks in which the attacker aims to establish an IP spoof connection to a server and then send payloads over this spoof connection. Next slide, please. So with such kind of TCP spoofing, attackers aim to evade any kind of host-based authentication. This could be an attempt, for example, to evade a firewall that allow list uh, certain IP ranges or client IPs, um, or it could be also um, attacks that are specific to certain application layer protocols. So for example, we showcased how an attacker um, can send IP spoofed spam by bypassing the standard policy framework, SPF, uh, which aims to enforce that only certain network ranges can send emails for a given sender domain. And therefore, uh, this lenient way of, of allowing ghost acts uh, actually does ease some of the attacks against application air protocols, such as send and spam. The two figures at the bottom uh, show how these attacks could work. On the left-hand side, in, in stage one, the attacker first has to brute force a TCP handshake by, by guessing the correct server chosen ISN. And, and yes, this is complex, right? In the worst case, this means that the attacker has to a spool 4 billion packets, but in a way with current network speeds that is actually uh, very viable. And once completed, in the second stage, the attacker then wants to use this spoofed connection in order to inject payloads into this IP spoof connection. And unfortunately, ghost acts are particularly helpful here because attackers uh, only have to guess the valid uh, send window and increments the acknowledgement number by a window every time. So in this example, we know the send window is 16-bit uh, large, which means that we only have to uh, try it to the power 16 times in order to hit a valid acknowledgement number. In contrast, if you would forbid such ghost acts, uh, it would significantly increase the complexity of injecting IP spoof payloads, uh, especially into fresh TCP connections. Next slide. So we studied uh, which of the TCP IP stacks are affected by, by ghost acts and found that most major OSs actually are uh, affected. So we found the behavior to be present in, in Windows, uh, Linux, and uh, the two major BSDs. And all of these operating systems would find, uh, would, would accept such ghost acts. Uh, with a little thing, a help of, um, from Michael, thanks a lot for this. Uh, we also worked on packet drills, which um, you can find the GitHub repository here in order to test for this. Um, but in a way, all the operating systems are actually affected by, by the attack. I should mention that the attack uh, assumes that there is no protection at the application layer protocols, of course. So if you have any authenticated or encrypted connections, um, for example, TLS or TCP AO or whatever, um, you're less affected to the attack because in, in that case, uh, attackers have to uh, either complete a much more complex handshake, which they cannot, uh, or they have to inject uh, secure data, which, which they also cannot due to lack of keys. Next slide. Nevertheless, we reach out to um, the OSs in order to um, start a mitigation effort. Um, and the first to react was Linux, which uh, mitigated the attacks um, by 
uh, dropping ghost acts. And to this end, uh, Linux at least is referring to RC4898, in which you do track some statistics about TCP connections. Uh, in particular, here, the number of um, bytes that were already acknowledged by the other side. And Linux therefore can now use this information in order to restrict the range of uh, acknowledgement numbers that should be accepted uh, by, by the, the, um, the sender of the data. So as you can see here in the green parts of, um, of the criteria, it's no longer checking whether uh, the acknowledgement number is uh, UNA minus send window, but now it's checking if the, um, if the acknowledgement number is send UNA uh, minus min send window or bytes act, which means if there have been no bytes act, then the acknowledgement number has to be exactly the UNA and next pointer, which then uh, goes back to uh, guessing the one in two to the power of 32 possibilities which are correct. Next slide. So to summarize, um, we, we found that there is ghost X, which are acknowledgement numbers uh, within the send window that acknowledge unsent data. Um, they ease TCP payload injection, especially for IP spoofed TCP connections in which the attackers control many of the other things, in, including sequence numbers. And we, we also found that major assets are affected by this. And uh, the, the reason why, why we are here presenting this to you folks is because we are actually interested in, in learning if this is something that, that you think should be uh, addressed in the standards. Uh, because I think it would be fairly easy to add an additional check in the standards uh, to get rid of ghost X. Uh, but also, you know, given that standards are actually fairly old already, I have very little experience in how we could approach this. So uh, as a, let me conclude this talk maybe with an open question to you folks. Um, do you think we should address this in some standard? And if so, um, I'm, I'm very open for your help. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Does it, oh, Michael. Um, <clears throat> so I think this, this is, um, I don't think we need an RC for this, but it could be done as a, as an uh, errata or something like this for uh, RFC for 5961. Um, basically, the, the Linux implementation has um, has uh, changed the condition which checks uh, for injection attacks there. Um, if we go down that path, I'm wondering for 5961, there, there are IPR claims. So um, changing this, um, changing that condition, does that, how does that relate to, to that IPR stuff? Some from the Linux community here, how they deal with this? Because in BSD, we, we, we allow this kind of stuff to be disabled. Yoshi, go ahead. OK. So yeah, I you know, uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate for this presentation. This is very interesting finding. Thank you so much uh, for bringing it here. So I have one clarification question, which is, uh, is this you know, vulnerability is only for SYNAC? It's the beginning of this TCP connection. And then other part is OK. That's what I would like to clarify first. So yes, I mean, our research paper goes a bit further in, in that we also show how we can more efficiently spoof the TCP handshake. But uh, I think our main takeaway in the research is actually that, yes, you don't have to be that accurate in sending the correct acknowledgement number in the spoof payloads that you try to inject into that connection. So I think that's the main takeaway. So we mainly actually focus on the act part, yes. Think right? I 
in my understanding, it's only for C, oh, no, no, not no, as an act. No, no, no. So, so we, we actually divide the attack in two stages. Mm -hmm. The first one is the um, the soon okay. act in which you uh, which you don't have to guess any acknowledgement number by the other side, and then. Um, we have the sun, white which is spoof, and the second segment you spoof is the ack, the final ack, in the handshake. Um, and, and that part we just brute force. So then we, in, in the worst case, actually just uh, show that you need two to power 32 different uh, spoofed acts. So the important part is now past this handshake. So once you do have an ISP spoofed connection, then uh, at this part, the ghost acts come into play. Because then you can use the ghost acts in order to inject IP spoofed uh, content into the IP spoofed connection. So that's where the uh, ghost acts are relevant. It's actually past the TCP handshake. Okay. Uh, so I think I missed a part. I think I need to read that paper a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, the solution you mentioned is you, we have to keep statistics, right? And then some implementation may do not want to do that. Then I was wondering if there is other way uh, to you know mitigate this issue. Yeah, it's it's, it's a good question. So we, we thought of a few. Um, you could also reduce the, the window in which you accept acknowledgement numbers. But in a way, I think the the, the this most safest. Uh, variant is really to track how many bytes uh, were acknowledged by the other side. And um, yes, yeah. this includes some statistics keepings. And I think all the other approaches um, will, will have problems in the long run. Mm. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Gori? Yeah, I was just wondering if you were intending to write a draft on this or whether it was something we had an errata for. So it's following up from Michael, but I loved the talk. It was interesting to see new new problems emerging. And I'm sure the intent was always not to do this. So uh, thanks ever so much for bringing this here and let's figure out how we document this and put it somehow into our record of how to do this well. Thanks ever so much. Uh, are you planning to write a draft on this? So as I said, it's it's not really our turf, so we have no experience in that. But we're very open to. It. So if if you think that's um, that's really applicable here, uh, I think Yipeng and me could both go ahead and, and write uh, at least a draft which um, illustrates the problem and also shows a couple of solutions out. So that if, if that's of general interest to you folks, I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah. I would speak to the chairs, but uh, I would think a very short draft would be a helpful document just to have to discuss. Uh, and it can really be done quite easily. So I'd encourage you to think about that and talk to the chairs. Thank you. Uh, Kyle? Yeah. Uh, I think this is great work. Uh, the one thing I just want to add, um, when using TLS um, for cases that are using TLS, CRTT, or uh, early data, I don't think that will provide protection um, against that. And I suspect this is not uh, a property that people generally consider when enabling um, TLS early data. So I do think this is important to uh, um, try to mitigate. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Uh, we, we think so too. So we're currently looking into um, into future problems that may arise out of this. And definitely TLS uh, zero out of prime is one issue we are currently looking at. And I can confirm it's it's probably problematic. Yeah. Uh, Yoshi? I just mentioned, I just want to mention that I basically agree with what Gori says. If you, you know, prepare some kind of short draft, that would be really helpful. That I personally think without chair hat. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for bringing this to us. Um, it was a really interesting presentation and extraordinarily nicely, nicely written. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.
unless anyone has anything else, I, I think that's all we have for today. Yeah. On the chat, there was someone asking for... Yeah, right. Jiang, you, have, you only have a five minutes if you want. Um, so the question of John on, on the um, stats issue? Well, let me uh, read it out. So the person who asked about MPTCP and MPQuick yeah all right it's hands now if not i would say we can close the session yeah looks like right. oh wait a minute now <laughs> okay yes you only have three minutes but you can try Um, we can't hear you if, did you want to address the question or should we end the session? There is someone in the queue. There is. Okay. Um, Maybe it makes sense to follow up on the list um, uh, if if that that ends up being a productive conversation. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and we will see you in Vancouver, I guess. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, Hello. our session is closed. Uh, I wanted to introduce my work about uh, uh, TCP, uh, MPTCP and uh, MPQuick. Uh, you know, uh, my idea is to com com combine uh, both MPTCP and uh, MPQuick. And uh, we did some work about, hear, right? how about uh, uh, I suggest you can uh, read my draft. I wanted to uh, okay. replace my draft in our worker group. Could you please give me some suggestion? I, I, send, I send my draft URL in the chat area. Yeah, yeah. You not only chat area, you can send no URL to the TCP mailing list. I think that's more useful. That's more effective. Oh, oh okay. I, I will send in the mail list. Uh, I, I wanna wanna to, to know when the next meeting in our uh, group. The next meeting. I want to enter okay. the meeting in our group. Okay. On the mailing list, we ask for requests for agenda items about, I would say, two weeks before the IETF meeting. Respond, and we'll see if we can schedule the presentation. Okay. And by the way, next meeting is July.
Okay. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Seems to be all, it has audio issue, I guess.